Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Red Raptor Writes. Well guys, we're finally here, at the long-awaited Planet Dinosaur Review. This has undeniably been my most requested video ever. This isn't the end, but I'm really thankful for this community that stuck with me for all this time. It's been a fun experience, plus I've learned a lot through the research I do before each video. Hopefully you've had an equally fungicational experience too. Planet Dinosaur is very similar to Dinosaur Revolution. They both have such high production values with CGI and many other designs that still hold up to this day. Their portrayals of prehistoric life are still highly accurate, until they aren't. So once again, there are different sides. Some people love it, others dislike it, and that's okay. This is one that I remember watching years back, so I'm curious to see how much it stands the test of time. And like with Monsters Resurrected, Planet Dinosaur is a six part series, which is way too much for one video, so I'll come out with two parts. Part one covers the first three episodes, part two will cover the latter three. In hindsight, I really should have split up walking with dinosaurs. Regardless, let's see how accurate is Planet Dinosaur. Not to be confused with Dinosaur Planet, although I'm sure I'll say Dinosaur Planet at some point. Let's dig this up. I have to commemorate the writers of this dinosaur documentary because they take the best route that I always encourage. Focus on the science. Like the 2007 Sea Monsters, the highest rated documentary so far, Planet Dinosaur constantly references fossil discoveries, nearly as much as I reference the Holy Trilogy. Oh boy, yeah. So for the most part, you know that the writers did their research rather than making stuff up to sound cool. Pretty much every point made is backed by evidence, sources cited. Judging on entertainment value, I can see how these constant interruptions hurt each episode's pacing, but accuracy-wise, it's great. Not every point is perfect, but we'll get to the problems eventually. This focus means that the series is able to show off these discoveries through dinosaur behaviors. For instance, we get a picture of the Hilda Mega bone bed as a herd of Centrosaurus attempt to cross a flooded river. The raging waters cause many to drown and preserve. The Spinosaurus diet is uncovered, not thrashing Rugops around like we've seen in the past, but was mainly composed of large fish in the ecosystem. A barb from the giant Cretaceous ray, Oncopristus, has been found in the upper jawbone of Spinosaurus, indicating a direct predator-prey relationship. The presence of young Iguanodon remains and fish scales in the stomach of the related Baryonyx suggests that although primarily piscivorous, Spinosaurids wouldn't pass on terrestrial prey. Heck, even aerial prey wasn't safe from them. In Brazil, a tooth from probably Irritator was discovered lodged into the neck vertebrae of an ornithochyrid pterosaur. Whether this was an example of predation or scavenging is unclear. We do see the Spino attack an Alanqua in reference to this, which is a nice detail. I had this dream once that I was being chased by a Spinosaurus. Yeah, it seems plausible to me. This ties into my next point, niche partitioning. Cenomania in North Africa had Spinosaurus, Carcharodontosaurus, Deltadromius, Rugops, Egyptosuchus, and Stomatosuchus all chilling together. With so many formidable predators in the same ecosystem, they had to be filling different niches, catching different prey. Otherwise, they'd all be in fierce competition, tugging on the same resources. Deltadromius is sadly absent, and Rugops is portrayed as a scavenger. Yeah, I'll get to that. But hey, we see this with Spino and Karkar. The former mostly ate aquatic animals, and the latter ate the large African herbivores. I mentioned this one before, so I'll be brief here. Planet Dinosaur shows us audiences several large predators from a variety of groupings and correctly compares how they would have killed. Tyrannosaurids developed round teeth and bone-crushing bites, Carcharodontosaurids had very sharp blade-like teeth for slashing, Spinosaurids used their conical teeth to catch slippery prey, and Abelisaurids had these super short, robust skulls that could grip small animals yet withstand the forces of larger struggles. If you haven't noticed yet, this documentary places a ton of focus on theropods and killing. Violence sells, I guess, so why bother with anything else? Well, at least we'll be able to see some animal violence. Which reminds me, I forgot to block the animal violence! 
Black, 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 black. Maybe there are a few more points for the theropods, but really nothing I haven't mentioned several times before. I wish I can compliment the herbivores more, but you'll see more of them in later segments. I guess, if anything, the Oranosaurus looks spot on. They're given that very long, low skull, almost like a true hadrosaurids. Instead of a copy of the thin Spinosaurus sail, we get a more hump-like structure since Oranosaurus had a thicker, flatter vertebrae. I can't compliment the other herbivores too much, but nice work here. And like in March of the Dinosaurs, us audiences are shown the unnamed Alaskan Edmontosaurus species. Instead of being called Ugunaluk, at this point it was still referred to as Edmontosaurus. The name Ugunaluk rose in 2015, only to fall back to Edmontosaurus two years later. So whether it be luck, coincidence, or knowledge of the future, Planet Dinosaur used the right name. You say your name right, right now. Ugunaluk. Say it right. Ugunaluk. Right. Edmontosaurus. That's better. <sighs> Thank you. At this point, it's tradition to mention Spinosaurus in Outdated, whenever it appears. We're still in that time frame when Spina was portrayed as avoided out baryonyx with a fancy sail. Now of course, more material shows an animal with shorter legs and a taller tail. Still no confirmation on the exact sail shape though. In past Dino Doc reviews, I have praised the proposed waiting method of feeding that we get here too. A 2021 study done by doctors David Hone and Thomas Holtz analyzed the anatomy of this predator, finding it more consistent with the shoreline feeding strategy than actively swimming down prey underwater. But while I write this in the March of 2022, a new study done by several authors including Nizar Ibrahim compares the bone density of Spinosaurus, its relatives, and many other dinosaurs to modern amniotes. What this new paper found was that Spino and Baryonyx had denser bones, more in line with diving aquatic creatures. While higher bone density doesn't automatically mean an animal was more aquatic, this is a good indicator since it helps them control their buoyancy. This probably isn't the final word on the subject, but it's where we're at right now. While we're talking about this, Spinosaurus is oversized here with estimates of 17 meters in length and 11 tons, Newer estimates are lower at 15 meters and about 7 tons. The second episode, Feathered Dragons, features the bizarre Epidexipteryx. I can't believe I got that in one shot. Here it's shown using its long fingers to pick out bugs from tree bark like an eye eye. However, in 2015 came the discovery of another closely related Scansoriopterid, Yi Chi. The Yi Chi specimen revealed the presence of a bat-like skin membrane between the fingers, maybe used in gliding. I am the knight. I am Batman! Although not as extreme, it's likely the Epidexipteryx possess something similar. Gigantoraptor makes another appearance, although not as colorful as last time. They'll see another mention in the problem section, but for now, Planet Dinosaur calls them the largest feathered animal discovered. Yeah, that wouldn't be the case for long with a description of U Tyrannus in 2012, a large Tyrannosauroid with direct fossil evidence of fluff, unlike the Gigantoraptor, which it's just presumed to have. Still, it's an incredible creature in its own right. On the other side of the spectrum, that same episode features the tiny dromaeosaurid Microraptor. Images of this bird-like dinosaur gliding its way through the forest are common and solidified in the history of paleoart. However, research in 2016 supported the idea that Microraptor was even capable of launching itself off the ground with powered flight, so it didn't need that goofy look of climbing trees so it can glide. Nah, its flaps are strong enough and mass low enough to lift itself. I'm free! The poor sign ornithosaurus did not reach the necessary benchmarks according to this study. <laughs> Time has not been kind to this microraptor, since additionally, we now know what color they were. A few decades ago, this would have sounded like science fiction, but by comparing their preserved melanosomes with those of modern birds, scientists have pieced together the colorations of quite a few feathered, non-avian dinosaurs. 
Using this technique, it seems that Microraptor wasn't the brown we see here, but a shiny iridescent black. So think of a crow and the, I had to google its name, common grackle that's so common here on the east coast. The aforementioned Synornithosaurus is given a significant role in episode 2 as a predator who bullies Microraptor. We can get back to this later, but Planet Dinosaur pushes a popular idea that these raptors were venomous. This now debunked paleomyth came from observations of cavities in the skull thought to house venom glands, elongated teeth, and the presence of grooves on their teeth that would have delivered venom into the bite. For years, Synornithosaurus was hailed as the venomous dinosaur, but like many dinosaur depictions, time was unkind. As for the teeth, well, it is common for dinosaur teeth to slide out of their sockets after death, causing them to look longer. Those grooves too match the condition of many other theropods no one considers venomous, dissimilar to the grooves in actually venomous reptiles. And lastly, the supposed cavity for the venom gland isn't really a thing, resembling the rest of the skull. So no, Synornithosaurus did not hunt with venom. Loser. Loser. <laughs> Lastly from this episode, it is worth pointing out that the small Ornithischian Jeholosaurus most likely had feathers. Back in the day, such filaments had only been known from the side of the dinosaur family tree, Saurischia, more specifically, theropods. But since Planet Dinosaur aired, feathers have been found beautifully preserved on some small Ornithischians as well, meaning that fuzz wasn't ancestral to just Solorosaurs or even to all theropods, but Dinosauria as a whole. Back to Jeholosaurus, as a small Neo-Ornithischian, this genus probably had fluff to keep warm. See, herbivores can be interesting too. My final outdated point I'll mention is a tiny detail. When describing the relationship between Ceratopsians and Tyrannosaurids, Raptor Rex briefly appears in one of the graphics. I've mentioned this a few times before, but yeah, this genus isn't valid. Raptor Rex wasn't some advanced early Tyrannosaur from the early Cretaceous, it really represents a young Tarbosaurus. Planet Dinosaur is weird because it does a lot right, a lot that no longer holds up, and a lot wrong. For instance, time traveling creatures hasn't been too much of an issue lately, but certainly needs to be addressed here. Time travel! I, I see this as an absolute win. Sorry, but this isn't a win. Pretty much the whole Dejucta formation is pushed 10 million years back in time. Protoceratops, Oviraptor, and Sauronitoides lived 75 instead of 85 million years ago. Oh, and then to make this segment worse, here comes Quantum Leaping Gigantoraptor that went 10 million years into the future. Oranosaurus and Sarcosuchus did both live in North Africa, but earlier in the Cretaceous during the Apidian stage over 110 million years ago, not during the Cenomanian 95 million years ago with the Baharia boys. Yes, I'm sorry writers, JPOG lied to you, get over it. And then comes Synraptor, which appears 6 million years later than it should, 160 MYA. With the amount of time travel going on, you'd think all the Infinity Stones would have been acquired already. Usually when doing these reviews, I get to mention the dinosaur designs as positives. While there are a few standouts, most of them are either relics of the past or are ever so slightly off, like the Chasmosaurus. Chasmosaurus can get an entire video to itself since it is the definition of a taxonomic nightmare right now, but its frill is kinda wonky. The very top is too straight where there should be a deep triangular chunk taken out of it. Then the holes in the frill are too round, ovular. Maybe you wouldn't see these in real life, but everyone gets shrink wrapped in Planet Dinosaur. But if we were to see these holes, they would be more triangular. I also want to love the Carcharodontosaurus, a wonderful carnivore with a mouthful of a name. Yeah, some behaviors were done well for it, but the head looks off to me. Maybe because it comes at the end of this long tyrannosaurid S-shaped neck. It needs a smaller neck and bigger skull. My hot take of the day is that Monsters Resurrected did Car Car better. Our non-venomous friend, Synornithosaurus, towers over Microraptor in Feathered Dragons, hunting it as prey, when really they were about the same size. Both Microraptorians were only over a meter long. And of course, I have to mention the Troodontids. Again, Troodon isn't a valid genus. 
Keep the Choadon name out of your gosh shrekking mouths. But whatever, each of this family shown should have a full feathery covering with proper wings. It's hard to tell whether they have some down feathers or only scales due to the animation. Both are wrong either way. With all the hype around this documentary, it's disappointing to see such obviously feathered dinosaurs receive the horrible scaly treatment. Behaviors too are another topic I usually focus on as positives. This isn't the case here. I tried to get some in, but really can't get that many here. Rugoff's is perhaps the most obvious example. This abelisaurid is given Tyrannosaurus treatment, since for seemingly no reason, it's called a scavenger. First time. Rugops, T-Rex, and now Allosaurus were not the respective Batmans of their environment. Each was perfectly capable of killing. Episode 3, Last Killers, presents the opposite problem. The female Majungasaurus is ruthless and bloodthirsty. The writers correctly point out how we have Majungasaurus fossils that show bite marks caused by other Majungasaurus. These were cannibalistic dinosaurs. Well, really most if not all theropods were cannibalistic. As gross as it is to us humans sitting behind a screen watching YouTube videos, cannibalism isn't the exception in nature, but the rule. Free food is free food. The stupidity lies in the way Planet Dinosaur goes about it. Instead of scavenging a carcass or finishing off a weak individual, the mommy Majunga sneak attacks an adult-sized male. As a large carnivore, the last thing you want to hunt is another large carnivore. That's a surefire way to get yourself injured or killed. Other suicidal predators are the quote-unquote Troodon and Aspletosaurus. The Alaskan Troodon makes the brain-dead decision to run right in the middle of an Edmontosaurus herd. If there is any guaranteed way to get yourself killed, that's gotta be it. A Daspletosaurus gang try the same trick too, only on a Centrosaurus this time. I have no idea why these horrible tactics work each time. They must be playing on easy mode or something. Now to close out this video, let's go over three stupid comments made by the narrator. Throughout episode 1, Lost World, he constantly emphasizes Carcharodontosaurus' supremacy over land, that it and Spinosaurus were the two dominant predators. Rugops is dismissed again, but then so is Delta Dromius. This large meat eater has been assigned to various positions on the theropod family tree, from a Noasaurid Ceratosaur to a Solorosaur or Neovenatorid. Whichever way you slice it, no responsible documentary can totally overlook its existence. Nanuxaurus sees the same treatment. If you're interested in this polytyrannosaurid, then check out my review on March of the Dinosaurs to learn more. In this series though, it's thrown in the trash, with the real garbage wastebasket Troodon receiving attention as the largest predator in the Alaskan Prince Creek Formation. No! If Nanuxaurus were to make an appearance at this time, it probably would have been called Gorgosaurus or Albertosaurus, but still, it's far better than nothing. And my final flaw with these first three episodes is the main thesis of Last Killers. Abelisaurids and Tyrannosaurids are hailed as the last of the killer dinosaurs. No. Apparently, the creators all forgot that birds are dinosaurs. Birds are killers too, guys. Need I mention modern birds of prey, the terrifying forest rackids, Hast's eagle? The world is has been, and will be, stalked by killer avian dinosaurs. Gosh dang it, there's so much content to cover in every category, and many fun discussions to be had. Venomous raptors, forgotten predators, flight capabilities, all great stuff. It's no wonder why this is my most requested video. I can't wait to see what kind of cool topics come up in the last three episodes, but until then, please remember to leave a like, subscribe, and check out my social media. See you next time.